Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the Nonprofit Learning Lab's free online webinar. You are currently participating in how to create an effective acknowledgement strategy for your nonprofit. Questions are encouraged throughout the webinar, and you can type them into the questions box as they arise. They'll be read by myself, Tori. I'm here uh, representing the Nonprofit Learning Lab today. You can also put any technical questions or issues you have in there if your audio isn't working, if you're unable to see, and we will help you out. Your presenter today is Virginia Davidson. Virginia is a member of LGL's customer support team. She has over 15 years of fundraising experience and is active in development as she fundraises for Alamo Rescue Friends, a nonprofit dog rescue organization she founded in 2010. Virginia loves sharing practical ways for fundraisers to be more efficient and effective. I will now hand it over to you, Virginia. Great, thank you, Tori. Welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're here today, uh, taking time out of your, your busy Monday to join us to talk about acknowledgements and how important they can be for your fundraising efforts at your organization. We have a few learning objectives uh, for our afternoon together. Um, in our time together today, we're gonna to quickly review the differences between thank yous and acknowledgements. We'll take a look at six common types of acknowledgements and the information that you need to include in each of them. And finally, we'll talk through how to set up and manage a system for your gift acknowledgements. We will save time for questions at the end, as Tori mentioned. Um, so let's jump in. I'm excited to be talking to you about acknowledgements today because I think that we as fundraisers, uh, we can tend to forget how powerful they are. A timely, accurate acknowledgement is such a great way to build trust with the donor right from the start. It lets them know you're organized, you're professional, that they can trust you. It strengthens their confidence in your organization and all the good work that you're doing. It also lays the foundation for the donor's relationship with your organization. A lot of my fundraising experience has been as a small shop fundraiser, so I've juggled a lot of moving parts as one person, and I'm sure that sounds familiar to a lot of you today. Um, and that experience has really taught me that if you're looking to have a healthy fundraising operation at whatever scale you're operating, if you want to retain donors, if you're soliciting major gifts, or you're looking to start or to expand a planned giving program, your chance of succeeding in those efforts is absolutely boosted when you have a strong handle on your acknowledgements. They seem so simple, they seem so basic, we can start to kind of ignore them as a, a rote task, but they are so powerful. They can open up a lot of opportunities with your donors, but the opposite is also true. If you don't have a strong handle on acknowledgements, you are going to have a hard time retaining donors and your organization will lose out on some opportunities as a result. I also know from the day-to-day -day work that Acknowledgements can cause a lot of stress uh, when you have a lot going on. And I know that most people do have a lot that they're managing. Um, so that's why I'm really glad you're here today because we're gonna give you the tools you need to create acknowledgement templates to have ready to go and to help you strip, uh, strip away the stress of acknowledgement so you can really harness the power for your fundraising efforts. So part one, thank yous versus acknowledgements. Many of us use the terms thank yous and acknowledgements interchangeably, but there are important differences between them. And being mindful of these ensures that your donors get the documentation they need and that you're fulfilling your organization's requirements to the internal revenue service. <clears throat> so a thank you expresses gratitude and it can be in a variety of forms. It can be a letter, a handwritten card, a phone call, videos are fun, even you know, words of gratitude expressed over a casual cup of coffee with a donor. Its purpose is to express gratitude. And it's definitely an important element of stewarding your donors. If you want to foster an ongoing relationship with a donor and have them continue to support your organization to retain that donor, they do need to be thanked. And acknowledgement does that and it does more. So in addition to expressing gratitude and stewarding your donor, it also serves as a record for the donor and it fulfills your organization's obligation to the IRS. For this reason, although there are lots of varieties of ways that you can express gratitude and a thank you, an acknowledgement needs to be in written form and it needs to include specific details and language. 
Now, in order to include those details in your acknowledgement, it's crucial that you have access to accurate gift records. So we're gonna take a step back for a moment and look at the importance of gift entry. I will not be offended if you just heard me say gift entry and thought, oh, that's so boring, because I know that for many people, data entry is not an exciting thing to do, and I get that. But I want, you, I want to encourage you to shift your thinking a little bit, humor me for a minute, and try to start thinking of gift entry as part of the story. If you as a fundraiser want donors to have a long relationship or a long story with your organization, gift entry is a big, big part of getting that story right off on the right foot. Um, because gift entry is key to your ability to send acknowledgements, and those acknowledgements are key to you retaining your donors. So what happens if you don't prioritize good and consistent gift entry? You're deciding that it's okay for the story to end with a donor after just one chapter. We all, we're fundraisers here, we all know how important donor retention is, so I think that's a very scary thought. Uh, enough to, to motivate you to, to really focus on your acknowledgements. So now that you're thinking of gift entry as part of a story, and maybe I can even convince you to think of acknowledgements as the unsung, unsung hero of that story, it'll feel a little more fun to think about capturing and recording the details of each gift. So each time a gift comes in, there are certain questions you need to be able to answer about that gift. Who gave the gift? What kind of gift did they make and in what amount? When was the gift made? Where should the gift be directed? Why did the donor make the gift? What, what did your organization do that prompted them to contribute? And how will the gift be acknowledged? So when you can answer each of those questions for a particular gift um, and you store that information, you'll have all the information in a gift record that you then need to not only send accurate acknowledgements, but also to be able to report on your fundraising and communicate donors in an ongoing way. Um, so I just wanna pause and highlight that consistency is key when it comes to gift entry. I'm sure this is not new to you. You've heard this before, but it bears repeating um, how important consistency is when it comes to gift entry. If there are two people working in your database and they enter gifts in different ways, for example, let's say my coworker, Timmy, who's on the webinar today, is entering in-kind gifts correctly, and I'm going in and I'm documenting them in the same way I enter financial gifts, we're gonna face some headaches down the road. I'm, I'm sure we've all been there. I know I've been in that position. I'm sure you have too, and um, it's something we all wanna avoid going forward. Um, so the key to avoiding that and saving that stress is documenting your gift entry process. Write it down, store it somewhere accessible, make sure other people in your office know it exists and where to find it. Um, doing that does take some time, that documentation, but the investment is absolutely worth it. Um, and it can also take some of the pressure off yourself, knowing that that document's there for you to refer to if you're kind of tired one day, you're drawing a blank, or if there's a certain type of gift that your organization doesn't receive very often, it can be hard to remember the nitty gritty of how to work with them. So if it's documented, you're really doing yourself a favor. And if if there are some of you uh, with us today who are solo pros um, managing the fundraising process for your organization all on your own, it's still worth doing for yourself. Um, I think it, it really takes some of the, the pressure off of retaining all that in your mind. So now let's pause for a survey. I'm always curious about how other people work. I love to hear about how other people manage their operations. So I'd love to hear from you. When it comes to acknowledgements, uh, do you write your acknowledgements on the fly? Do you have templates ready to go? Or do you do some combination of both of those things? So everyone should see a poll coming across your screen and you'll be able to select which option uh, most applies to you. Seeing a lot of great engagement. I'll be closing the polls in just a few seconds. So for our results, we have 8% reporting that they write acknowledgement letters on the fly. 
58% reporting they have templates ready and 35% a combination of both. Great, okay, so a good mix there. Um, so for those of you who have templates ready to go, um, I think you'll, this will be a good opportunity for you to check your templates against what we're sharing. Um, make sure you have all the key elements in there ready to go and get some tips on keeping those up to date. Um, and for those of you who are, who are just embarking on the process of um, creating your templates, um, I'm excited to share our tips with you today. Um, and those of you who are doing a combination, we may be sharing some templates that are new to you that you can add to your own library. Um, I'm a big believer that front loading your work and making acknowledgement templates for yourself is really a fundraiser's secret weapon. When you have a library of those templates, templates again, it takes some of the stress and leg, leg work off your plate. You may be catching a theme with me. I want to try and avoid stress when possible. Um, you have enough of that already. I know that. So when you create and maintain a library of templates, you'll save yourself from having to Google in a panic, you know, how to acknowledge gift from donor advised fund um, as you're also trying to get that acknowledgement out the door before the post office closes for the day. So moving into part two, types of gift types of gifts to acknowledge. We are going to look at six common types of acknowledgements together today. Uh, the first, financial gifts, probably the one you're all quite familiar with, the most common. In-kind gifts, which depending upon your organization, you may they may be very common or pretty rare. Pledges, soft credits, and we're specifically going to look at um, gifts from donor advised funds. Memorial gifts and sponsorships. At Little Green Light, we get a lot of questions about these gifts, um, both on how to enter them and how to acknowledge them. I know I was helping someone earlier today um, with a, a pledge situation they'd run into in terms of, oops, they'd gotten not quite the right information um, into their letter responding to a pledge and needed to do a little, a little back work to clear that up. Um, so we all face these hiccups along the way. And my hope is that we can help you feel confident with these types of acknowledgements so that after this webinar, you'll be in really good shape moving forward. So we'll dive into financial gifts first um, because these are probably the most common type of gift that you need to acknowledge in your work. So some background may be um, reinforcing for some of you new information for others. In order for a donor to claim a tax deduction for gifts of $250 or more, the Internal Revenue Service requires that you, as the nonprofit, provide the donor with a letter that includes the organization's name, the date the gift was received, and the amount, as well as a statement that your organization is a tax exempt nonprofit recognized by the Internal Revenue Service. While the IRS requirement is specific to the amount of $250, it's a best practice to be in the habit of sending an acknowledgement for gifts under that amount too. So don't, don't ignore those smaller gifts. Uh, typically, you'll also include a statement saying that no goods or services were received in exchange for this gift, which means that the gift is tax deductible for the donor. But if they did receive something in exchange, uh, for example, you might um, send a thank you gift like a mug, you'll need to state that. So in that circumstance, if your donor let's say they sent you a check um, for $100, they received a mug from your organization valued at $10, the deductible amount of their gift is $90. So thinking back to our earlier conversation about gift entry, you can see those parts fitting together now, right? So in order to meet these requirements, there's some particular information you need access to. You need to know the name of the donor, the deductible amount of the gift, and the date of the gift. So let's look at a basic example of this together. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your gift of $250 received on June 3rd, 2021. Your generous support means that 10 local families will enjoy hot meals each day this week. We are working hard to ensure that no family in any town goes hungry and people like you make it possible. And then it goes on to explain no goods or services were received in exchange for this contribution. ABC Food Bank is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, federal tax ID, and your gift is tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. Please retain this receipt for your records. 
So that's a template of a financial gift. Um, if you're taking notes, don't worry, I believe you'll have access to these slides so you can refer to the examples and use them as a jumping off point to craft your own. You'll notice some of the slides have a lot of text and that's to make it easy for you to get what you need after this webinar. I find myself it can be daunting to start with a blank page, um, so I would help you avoid that part of the process and you can use these templates to avoid the blank page stage altogether. Um, so the examples we're sharing today are, are basic. So of course you will want to add your organization's voice and personality to your own template, um, share information about your work and so on. But you can see here in this example of a financial gift acknowledgement uh, that this does include the essential elements. The name of the donor, the amount of the gift, the date of the gift, a statement that no goods or services were received in exchange for the gift, the name and the federal tax ID of the organization. So those elements meet the requirements, and this also includes an expression of gratitude. Let's move on to in-kind gifts. These acknowledgements have some important differences from the acknowledgement of a financial gift. When a donor makes an in-kind gift, for example, maybe they donate furniture for your office, your acknowledgement needs to include a description of the donated item. So thinking back to gift entry again, this means that you need to be sure to store that information, that description of the gift, somewhere in the gift record. You can't lose that. Uh, but even if the donor gives an item and says to you, here's a desk I wanna to donate to your organization, it's worth $100. You, as the nonprofit, do not include an estimated value in your acknowledgement. It's the donor's responsibility in this circumstance to seek the fair market value. So let's look at our next example. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your gift of 10 pounds of food received on June 3rd, 2021. Your generosity means that 10 local families will enjoy hot meals each day this week. We are working hard to ensure that no family in any town goes hungry and people like you make it possible. It goes on to say, no goods or services were received in exchange for this contribution. ABC Food Bank is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, federal tax ID. It is the responsibility of the donor to place a value on in-kind contributions and provide appropriate documentation to the IRS for tax purposes. Please retain this receipt for your records. So like the acknowledgement for a financial gift that we looked at a moment ago, in this one, we have the name of the donor and we have the date of the gift. Because it's for an in-kind gift, we don't list an amount or a value, but we do provide a description of the item. In this case, it was pounds of food. Uh, we also have a statement that no goods or services were received in exchange for the gift. We include the name of the organization and the federal tax ID. And again, a little different from the financial gift acknowledgement, we let the donor know it's their responsibility to seek a value for the in-kind gift. Pledges. As I mentioned, I was helping someone with a question about pledges today. So we see a lot of questions um, about working with pledges. First and foremost, this was part of the confusion this morning, a pledge is a promise to donate a specific sum to your organization. Since a pledge itself is not an actual financial gift, it's really important that you create templates specifically for pledges. Since it's not a gift, you can Imagine that you won't include the tax deductible language that we've seen in the last two examples. But uh, this is a really important opportunity to thank the donor, confirm your expectations of how that, that promise to pay will be fulfilled, provide the donor with information that makes it easy to fulfill their promise, and can make it easier on your end to manage and follow up with pledges. So let's look at our example. Dear so-and-so, Thank you for your gift of $2,000 made on January 20th, 2021. Your commitment of support will make so much possible for our organization and we are grateful for your generosity. You have chosen to fulfill your pledge of $2,000 with four payments. Those payments are as follows. First installment, $500 due on March 31st, 2021. Second installment, so uh, and so on for four installments and for each listing the amount expected and the due date that that payment is expected by. 
For your convenience, we have enclosed remittance envelopes, which can be used to submit your payments, or you can pay securely online at our website. If you have any questions regarding your pledge, you are welcome to contact the development officer at you know, the contact information for phone number and email. Thank you again for your commitment of support. Here again, we have the name of the donor, we have the date the pledge was made, and the amount of the pledge. We list the expected payment amounts and dates for each, offer instructions on how to pay, and we list a specific person uh, to contact with questions. You do not see a statement about goods or services or language about the gift being tax deductible because again, we don't have a gift yet. A pledge is a promise to pay, so you haven't received any funds. When the donor does indeed make a pledge payment, let's say March 31st rolls around and $500 arrives right on time, that's great. That's when you will then send an acknowledgement as you would for a financial gift. Um, and earlier I mentioned how acknowledgements can help build trust. And I think pledges, um, by calling out those details of when payments are expected in the amounts and the dates, um, that just makes things clear between you and the donor. Um, and I think that goes a long way to avoiding any misunderstandings and um, building trust. We get a lot of questions about how to acknowledge gifts from donor advice funds, maybe as many as pledges. Um, so our fourth uh, template we'll look at together today um, is acknowledging gifts from donor advised funds. You may be seeing an uptick in these contributions at your own nonprofit. I think a lot of organizations are. Um, so natural that as the contributions increase, so do the questions. Uh, so just a little bit of context on donor advised funds. A donor advised fund is a philanthropic vehicle established by institutions like investment firms or community foundations. Some of the names you may be familiar with um, in relation to donor advised funds may be Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, um, maybe your own community foundation or state foundation. The way it works is a donor makes a charitable contribution to their donor advised fund and they receive an immediate tax benefit at that time. Um, then the donor no longer has legal control over the money once it's in their donor advised fund, but they do they can recommend uh, that grants be distributed from their fund um, to eligible charities of their choosing. Unlike foundations, public and private, donor advised, donor advised funds are not required to disperse to nonprofits each year. So you may have a donor who moved a sum of money into a donor advised fund six years ago, received their tax benefit, and maybe only you know, in 2022 start to um, recommend that, that funds be dispersed to nonprofits, the money may be sitting there. When you receive a gift from a donor advised fund, then this may sound familiar to some of you who've worked with them, it'll be accompanied by a letter that will read something like this. And the letter will come from, let's, let's in this example use Fidelity. So it'll say something like, it is a pleasure to present a thousand dollar grant to ABC organization. This grant was made at the recommendation of a fund advisor through a donor, donor advised fund at Fidelity. I even have trouble saying donor advised fund over and over. Um, it will list the fund name, so let's say Schmidt Family Fund, uh, and then please note that it is not necessary to send Fidelity any tax receipt or acknowledgement letter, and we ask that you do not add Fidelity to your mailing list. So the check, al along with the letter, the check for the funds will uh, be from the donor advised fund, so it'll be from Fidelity. It won't be from directly dispersed by the person who recommended the gift, not from a personal checking account. So first things first, you don't need to send a letter to Fidelity. You should send a thank you to the donor who recommended the gift. Here, we're talking about a thank you. You wanna express gratitude, steward your relationship with that donor. Uh, so hopefully they'll continue to recommend that your nonprofit uh, receive funds from their donor advised fund. So just like we recommended for pledges, you should create a template specifically for this scenario. Let's look at an example. Dear so-and-so, Thank you for recommending that we receive a generous grant of $1,000 through your donor advised fund at XYZ Foundation. We have received the grant and the funds will make a profound difference in the lives of seniors in our community. Thank you again for caring so deeply about the mission of ABC organization. We are grateful for your support. Please note, this is not a tax receipt. You may contact the organization that sponsors your donor advised fund with questions about your eligibility to claim a tax deduction. 
So what do you see in this one? You see the name of the person, an expression of gratitude. You do not see a statement about goods or services, and you don't see a statement um, saying that you know these funds are eligible uh, for tax deduction. In fact, you see the opposite of that. You see a, clear, a line that clearly says, this is not a tax receipt. So remember that the person who recommended the gift got their tax benefit when they moved money into their donor advisor fund at some point in the past. So that element has already been taken care of long before the money got to you. They do not get to claim another t uh, deduction for these same funds again when the funds are then dispersed to your organization. So by including a line that clearly states that this isn't a tax receipt, you can help avoid any confusion uh, with the donor. And again, that goes back to the idea of building trust and building confidence with your donors. Our fifth type of acknowledgements are, uh, we're gonna look at memorial gifts. And um, people tend to get nervous when it comes to memorial gifts, and that is understandable, I get that. Um, the biggest reason, it's an emotional situation and that can feel uncomfortable. Um, you don't wanna offend someone or hurt someone's feelings or take a misstep in a situation which is hard and emotionally charged. Uh, we, can, we can all understand that. And for another reason, there are a few different components when working with memorial gifts that, um, that can be a little intimidating. So let's address, address a few things right off the bat. Um, death is a hard topic, we all know that but do remember that it's not your job as a fundraiser to console. So that responsibility is not on you. When you send acknowledgements for memorial gifts, that letter, just imagine that that letter may well be a bright spot for the people grieving. You're letting them know their gift is memorializing someone in a meaningful and thoughtful way. So your organization is helping to carry a legacy forward. The other thing to keep in mind is that in many cases, there are two communications when you're working with a memorial gift. So there's the acknowledgement letter to the donor who made the gift. And then in addition, there is the notification letter to the family of the deceased. So those are two separate things and we will share examples of each. So here's our example of a memorial gift acknowledgement. Dear so-and-so, Thank you so much for your donation of $50 to the Ocean Point Land Trust, dated March 1st, 2021. Your contribution in memory of Sarah Jennings will carry Sarah's legacy forward and help protect open space in our community. Thank you for this meaningful gift. No goods or services were received in exchange for this contribution. Ocean Point Land Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, federal tax ID, and your gift is tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. Please retain this receipt for your records. As far as your acknowledgement goes, when you read or listened to that letter, you're probably noticing that acknowledging a memorial gift requires the same details as an acknowledgement for a financial gift. And you're right, it's the same. So we have the name of the donor, the amount of the gift, the date of the gift, no goods or services uh, were received in exchange, and the federal tax ID. Plus, you should reference the fact that this was a memorial gift. Um, does the IRS care? No, not a bit, doesn't matter to them. But it does matter a great deal to the recipient. Um, so do, do include the name of the person being memorialized as well. Again, think back to gift entry. This means you need to capture and store the name of that person in the gift record. So you need to have a system in place to store these details from memorial gifts so that you can then extract them um, and handle your memorial gift acknowledgements. Now here's our memorial uh, gift not or memorial notification letter to the family. Dear so-and-so, please accept our condolences on the loss of your wife, Sarah. We feel privileged to be able to honor Sarah's memory and her commitment to land conservation thanks to donations received in her memory. To date, we have received the following gifts in her memory. Then we list two donors with their mailing addresses. We have thanked these generous donors on behalf of Ocean Point Land Trust. We are sharing their addresses in case you wish to contact them directly. We will send you additional donor names and addresses periodically as gifts are received. So this is your notification letter to the family. 
it is not performing the same function as an acknowledgement. You're sending it to the family of the deceased, not to the donor. Uh, you should not include gift amounts in your notification letter to the family. Leave, leave those out. You don't get into the specifics of amounts. And you don't include a statement about tax deductions, of course. So although this, this is serving a different function um, than, than the acknowledgement letter you sent to the donor, you can see how a letter like this um, is incredibly helpful to the family because it gives them all the information they need to thank the donors if they wish to, um, they, so they know who have made gifts in memory of their loved one. And it's letting them know what to expect going forward, that if and when more gifts are received, the organization will let them know in this same manner. And of course, you're referencing the name of the deceased. So this notification letter reminds the family of how many people are thinking of them uh, during a hard time. So think about being on the receiving end of a letter like this. Maybe, maybe some of you have been. You're grieving the loss of someone dear to you, and this letter reminds you of the lives that your loved ones touch, which you're now seeing through these, these donations. Um, so I just want to pause on that because I think it's a pretty special thing as a fundraiser to be in a position to send a letter like this that can be so meaningful um, to people in your community. Um, so I think you know the work you're doing is really important, of course, every day, but I think it, it really shines through when you're working with memorial gifts. And I think it's important to, to remember that. Moving on to our sixth type of acknowledgement, sponsorships. Um, when you receive a sponsorship, typically to sponsor an event, you need to be very careful about your tax language. This is because typically sponsorships aren't tax deductible because the donor is getting something in exchange, right? They're sponsoring your event and in exchange, you're providing signage at the event. Uh, you may be putting their logo on your event invitations, listing them in press releases, giving them tickets, et cetera. So this certainly can vary from organization to organization or event to event, um, but depending upon the way you've structured your sponsorships, a company may be sponsoring you for, let's say, $2,000, getting $1,500 worth of advertising, and then that remaining $500 is a charitable contribution. If, if you're in a position where you're not quite sure of those details, um, it's best to check with your coworkers or maybe your organization's uh, bookkeeper or accountant to, to firm those up and make sure uh, you're quite clear on, on those details. Um, but in most cases, sponsorships aren't tax deductible. So let's look at an example together for that particular scenario. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your company sponsorship of $1,000 received on April 5th, 2021. XYZ Industries' generous support of our upcoming virtual harvest dinner is greatly appreciated. ABC Food Bank is working hard to ensure that no family in any town goes hungry, and your support makes that possible. Your sponsorship at the bronze level entitles you to the following benefits. Your company logo in our event invitations and event signage, your company name listed in related press releases and in our fall 2021 newsletter, two tickets to the virtual event on November 28th. If you have any questions about your sponsorship benefits or the event, please contact the event coordinator at their email address. Thank you again for your sponsorship. So in this template, we have the name of the donor, we have the amount received and the date. We do not have a statement about uh, you know, no goods or services were received or about tax deductions. Um, so in this letter, you confirm the benefits they're receiving. And to me, this comes back again to the idea of building trust. Um, particularly, I think with events when there are so many <laughs> moving parts, um, any opportunity to be clear and confirm details in advance um, is really important. So you list the sponsorship level and the particular benefits. And, and by doing that, you can avoid misunderstandings down the road. You know, if they call you the Thursday before the event and say, hey, we only have two tickets. I thought we were getting five. Um, and all of a sudden you have a, a fire to put out. Um, or maybe there was already, you know, an, an innocent miscommunication about a benefit. Um, and, and if that's the case, when they get this letter, you'll know sooner and then you can all resolve those, those issues in advance of the event. Um, 
And, and for those reasons, you provide a specific contact name in case of questions, um, make it easy for them to get in touch with the, the right designated person at your organization who can has the information to straighten things out or answer their questions when they contact you. And you include an expression of gratitude in your sponsorship template. So now that we've looked at six examples together, I hope you're feeling clear and confident about creating um, acknowledgements for a variety of different types of gifts and different scenarios, and that you're feeling ready um, to create a library of acknowledgement templates for yourself, or if you already are working with some, some templates, um, you're kind of inspired to go back, make sure you're including all the appropriate information in each one and maybe adding some additional templates that perhaps are, you're still creating on the fly, but you'd like to pin down. Um, when you do that, when you sit down to work on your library of acknowledgement templates, create a, uh, a generic template for each type of gift. Um, you know, maybe start with the ones that you work with more frequently, but again, going back to those in-kind gifts, which at some organizations are rare, um, even if they are rare, I, I urge you to go ahead and create one just so you are prepared um, in advance. And label those templates clearly um, and don't edit your original template. Um, keep your original template clean so you can always refer back to it. If you goof on something, um, you, can, you can start over with your clean template and, and go from there, start over fresh. Um, and then once you've done that, once you've created your library of your basic templates, um, think about kicking it up a notch and start to craft your acknowledgements at the same time as your solicitations. Um, so as you're drafting your appeal letter, um, which I know we all spend a lot of time really perfecting and trying to strike just the right tone. In that same, when you're in that same flow, also draft your acknowledgement letter for that appeal or that event. And that way the tone of it will align with your ask and it'll feel really cohesive to the donor. And that's just a nice donor experience. It's also kind of less shifting gears for you. You're, if when you're thinking about a particular ask and that's top of mind for you, stay in that zone and see it through to the end and also draft your acknowledgement. Um, so again, when you do that, you're front loading your work. So you'll be ready to generate those acknowledgements as soon as gifts start rolling in. So thinking more broadly about setting up an acknowledgement system, what should it include? We recommend that it includes that library of templates that we've talked about, um, that you pin down your gift entry and acknowledgement process, um, decide the workflow, write it down, document it for yourself and for your other team members. And when you do that, think about what timetable is realistic for your organization, not your ideal, but what's realistic. And that's going to vary. So some organizations are doing gift entry and sending out acknowledgements every single day and donors are getting their acknowledgement within 24 hours. That's awesome. That's great. That's that's what we strive for. But other organizations have someone, a volunteer, who is going to the post office to check the mail every Friday. And then they're entering gifts and sending um, an acknowledgement. So if that is the capacity of your organization, that is great too. What I would what I would recommend is that you be realistic about your capacity, you pinpoint what you want to do, and then be consistent. Um, so as with your data entry for your gift records. Uh, the consistency of sending out your acknowledgements is important. Um, I think in some, sometimes it can go to the back burner, especially if you are a, a solo pro in your, uh, as the only fundraiser in your office. Um, so just um, keep them top of mind and, and part of your regular work. Um, with your templates, review and update them on a regular basis. And do get into the habit of preparing your acknowledgement templates as you craft solicitations for specific uh, events and appeals. So let's review our key takeaways today for our time together this afternoon. Um, as we've looked at in the six templates we've covered together, the information in each varies and sometimes what not to include in an acknowledgement is as important as what to include. So an example of that is the the donor advised fund letter, right? You you don't include that statement that your gift is tax deductible, whereas that statement is very important to include in your financial gift acknowledgement. Um, 
when you commit to preparing generic templates in advance, it will save you time and stress as, as gifts are rolling in. And I know at Little Green Light, we, we love saving time and stress um, for everyone, for our customers and for ourselves. So that's just so important for the work you're doing in nonprofits. Um, save stress wherever you can. Remember that sending accurate acknowledgements is a tool for donor stewardship and for donor retention. And we are we all want to retain those donors um, and acknowledgements are your key to that. Um, and finally, you can't uh, you can't generate accurate acknowledgements without a commitment to good gift entry. So that's that's so key um, and always worth time and effort um, to ensure consistency with your gift entry. Um, if you run into questions along the way as you're working with your acknowledgements, um, your organization's bookkeeper or accountant can be a really good way to get questions answered about tax deductions or a particular type of gift. Um, you can also turn to your state or community nonprofit resource center for help. And you're always welcome to check out Little Green Lights blog where we have a lot of articles um, with fundraising tips and we do have a guide to acknowledging gifts that you can download if you want a lot of this information in written format to refer to that is available on our website as well. Um, so finally, I want you to remember that the time you invest in building your library of templates and ensuring good data entry and accurate acknowledgements is so well worth it. Um, it may not it may not be the most or seem like the most exciting element of a fundraising program, but it is it is just the key to everything. It's so crucial. It lays the foundation for all your efforts. Um, so these acknowledgements that we've explored today together are your key to building trust with your donors um, and the first step towards donor retention for your organization. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and we have saved time to answer plenty of your questions. Um, my colleague, Timmy, is here with me today and we will be answering uh, your questions together. Thank you so much, Virginia. I'm going to kick it off. We've got a whole bunch of questions coming in today. Um, uh, the first one is coming from Karen asking, do gifts of securities fall in the category of in-kind gifts? That is such a good question. Um, gifts of securities, Timmy, you can, you can jump in. My understanding, I know that they are very, very specific and I will recommend that you talk to your organizations accountant um, because I know that it is um, I, I don't know that they count as in-kind gifts but I know that the value of the stock that's pretty specific about when that value is documented um, so I'm sorry I don't have a more a more clear answer for you except that is one I would go to your accountant with I don't know Jimmy if you have additional insights to offer on that one yeah, that was my experience as well. I mean, it's a document stock gifts. We really turn to our our accountant uh, and bookkeeper for assistance, making sure they were documenting the correct amount at the time that the gift was given. Okay, great, thanks. Awesome. Our next question is coming from Maggie, um, asking or saying we recently held an online auction and received in kind gifts from donors to be auctioned off, proceeds to benefit our organization. Do you have any advice on if it matters whether we make any mention in the acknowledgements for these in-kind gifts about the specific amount that each gift raised, i.e. what the, mini, the winning bid amount was? Ah, that is a really good question. I, to my knowledge, you are not um, required to share what the final bid was. Is that your understanding as well, Timmy? Yes, that is my understanding as well. Okay, so what I, what I will share, um, is so you're not required to share it it can feel like you know it's interesting to know what things went for i myself have been in some situations where <laughs> you can learn from from what we did um, we did include the final bid um, in letters to donors and in some cases when the final bid was perhaps um, not as high as the donor thought the value or you know as the donor hoped it would go for or, or thought it would really gain more attention the donor was kind of upset um, and that's a sticky situation to work through. Um, so I would I would recommend not including it um, and and just communicating, you know, how successful the event was, give the overall total raised, and how vital their in kind contribution was to reaching that total, but leave the specifics out. And I would totally agree with that, Virginia. 
Okay. <laughs> Our next question comes from um, Melissa saying, I'd love some good language to use when only part of the donation is deductible. For example, our gala base ticket is 125, but the cost is 90. So for those who just get the base ticket, I don't like saying thanks for the big check, but only 35 is deductible. How can I phrase this more positively? Mm, that is a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm off the top of my head, so my language may not quite be as elegant as you'd want in written. Um, but sometimes what I think can be helpful in those cases, because it is, um, I, I love that you want to state it more positively, because um, I think that it is funny to say, hey, thanks so much, but only this is, is deductible. Um, to include that in um, in the, the bottom section, where if you notice sort of a pattern in a lot of the templates we looked at today, the top portion of the communication is it has a different tone, it's more narrative, it's friendlier. And then the bottom is kind of where you plug in the businessy side of things <laughs> to a certain extent, your federal tax ID and your tax language. And so I think um, one thing that I like to do is to keep that top portion, you know, glowing and 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 um, really grateful and let them know about your organization. And then you can you can kind of switch your tone in the bottom to say, your gift of seventy-five dollars um, is tax deductible, less less the value of the meal at forty dollars or whatever. So that again, that's not really changing the language to make it more positive, but it, it gives you the chance to be really positive in the top part, but fulfill your commitment um, and and to be clear in the bottom part where I think people understand, hey, now we're kind of switching into business mode and um, we're not going to be quite as effervescent in our language. Great. Our next question comes from Vicki asking, for memorial gift acknowledgements and notifications, what do you do if you do not have the information of the family of the deceased? Mm, that is a great question. Yeah, so sometimes um, your organization may hear from a family or you may even see that you were named in an obituary. Um, you know, we ask that gifts be made and um, so uh, you, you can anticipate that they're coming or in other cases, um, people are making gifts in memory of a constituent in your database who's been part of your organization for a long time and you may be able to track down um, that information. So if you don't have the information of the family, um, I think you can certainly make a good faith effort to to get it. And, and I think there are totally appropriate ways to do that, which is you can, um, if if it's a local family and survivors are named in the obituary, you may be able to deduce um, who those folks are and get contact information. If you do that, you can also ask. We've re we've started receiving donations in, in memory of your loved one. Would you like us to notify you? Um, another option, which I think a lot of organizations do, so you, you don't need to um, feel like it's crossing a line, is to contact the funeral home um, if, who's make, taking care of arrangements. So if, if in an obituary your organization is named and the arrangements in the, are in the care of whichever funeral home, you can reach out to them and ask, is there a family member, um, you know, explain the situation, that it's that it's a, um, a, a positive thing that you, you would like the information for the family member because your organization has started receiving gifts. And you can also say, you know, reverse it and say, if our organization has started receiving gifts, you're working with the family, could you pass along our information? We'd love to notify them of these gifts if they're interested, if they're interested, here's my name at the organization and they can reach out. Um, in some cases, you may not, you may not know. Um, and in those cases, I would continue to document your memorial gifts um, as you are. So continue to store that deceased name. It may be that in the future, um, it comes to light someone in the family, um, but it may be that, that in those cases, you are simply sending the memorial gift acknowledgement to the donor and you are not notifying the family. Great. Um, we have another question asking if you guys have any insight on using the stewardship element of Little Green Light in, a, in an acknowledgement system. How to best document actions that stewards take? I might toss this one to Timmy. If that's okay, Timmy. Um, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I guess I would say that um, I have not seen it much in practice where um 
you're utilizing information in the acknowledgement um, that is pertinent to the steward. But um, I think the other part of the question was how can you use Little Green Light potentially to document the steps that you're taking or that the steward has taken with the development of the relationship um, with that particular donor? Um, and I would say in that instance, I think utilizing Little Green Light's contact reports and task management system would be really beneficial. Um, that way you're able to track those various touch points and communications that you've had with the donor um, in your stewardship efforts. Oh, and actually, as Timmy was talking, I had another thought, which is um, this. So typically, as Timmy was saying, that the steward may play more of a role in the solicitation and the cultivation. The acknowledgement will come from a staff member at your organization. But this is also a good chance to think about you have the acknowledgement and you have the thank you. So if part of your acknowledgement process is to acknowledge the gift and then stewards reach out with the thank you phone call, um, that's a great place, as Timmy was saying, to use the contact reports or the tasks to schedule um, that follow-up thank you phone call uh, with the, the steward for that donor. Great, we have another question um, about Little Greenlight asking uh, or saying, I'm relatively new to LGL and still learning. How can I make sure the amount given pulls into my acknowledgement letter accurately? Do all gifts have to be tied to an appeal? Okay, um, so all gifts do not need to be tied to an appeal. Um, generally speaking, they will be, and if there if there's not a clear connection um, that a, a gift is in response to an appeal, we typically typically um, you know you can you can just leave it as I'm forgetting the word to me. But anyway, you can have a a, a nun or something like that. Um, but it's not you can save a gift record without assigning an appeal um, in your acknowledgments. If you're new to LGL. Um, Gift records um, are the key for your acknowledgement. So an acknowledgement letter is attached to a particular gift record as opposed to a constituent record. And so when you use um, the little green light merge field, so your it's gifts.act.amount um, in brackets in LGL, that will pull in the amount of the gift that you're acknowledging um, on that gift record. Uh, so that's how you'll pull in the accurate amount. Um, the key thing to remember that might be new to you if you're new to Little Green Light is that in LGL acknowledgements are handled in batches. So if you have a draft mailing, all of the gift records assigned to that template in draft um, will be included in that mailing. And so if I've uh, received gifts from two constituents, uh, or sorry, from two gifts from the same constituent and assigned an acknowledgement template, um, if I haven't sent one letter last week and I leave it in draft, that some of the two gifts will be included. So that's why it's always important to mark your acknowledgements as sent. Um, in some cases, um, organizations may be intentionally sending or uh, acknowledgements once a week, uh, once every two weeks. And so they do want those sums of multiple gifts from the same constituent um, tallied or totaled in the amount, but otherwise you do need to mark your mailing as sent. And I Great. would just say that also, um, you know, if you are a Little Green Light user and you do have specific questions about how to use Little Green Light most effectively, um, definitely feel free to reach out to us um, through our help system that's located inside your Little Green Light account. And we can also direct you to um, documentation and videos and even training webinars we have on these topics. Great. So we have a lot of questions asking about um, acknowledgements, if there is a minimum amount for an, an, a gift acknowledgement, as well as how to handle monthly gifts and acknowledging monthly gifts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, again, for the IRS, there that threshold at which point you are required to send one is $250. But I think um, Sending one for every gift, regardless of the amount, is is really the best thing to do um, from a best practice standpoint and from stewarding your donors and expressing gratitude. You might decide, um, I know some organizations, if they receive gifts, um, let's say under a certain amount, maybe under $25 and under, they may send um, a postcard acknowledgement, which still includes um, the tax language and all those important details, but it's in a different format um, than 
the fuller letter. Um, that's one option that some organizations choose, and I think that's that's done mostly from a cost perspective, so they're saving on maybe uh, printing as well as postage for the postcard stamp. Um, for recurring gifts, those are essentially financial gifts, so all of those requirements um, come into play with recurring gifts. They're really no, no different except that they're recurring, I would say, on a monthly basis. Um, in those cases, you may choose to acknowledge each gift as it's received, or some organizations um, will choose to acknowledge that first gift and then um, at the end of the year provide a list of, of the each of the recurring gifts just to reduce um, paper and mail. Um, if you choose that, that latter approach of um, acknowledging recurring gifts in one swoop at the end of a calendar year, I think it's really important to state that that's your process at the beginning so that when you acknowledge that first recurring gift, um, again, coming back to, to setting the tone with your donor and building trust, you let them know that you appreciate their support and at the end of the year, you will send them um, a statement of their, uh, or an acknowledgement for their recurring gifts just so that they're, they're not expecting it and thinking that you've dropped the ball. Um, and one other thing I will toss in with that is um, sometimes pledges and recurring gifts um, may be thought of under the same umbrella and they're really quite different, um, both in terms of how you manage them, acknowledge them, all of those things. So if, um, if you're kind of sorting through those nuances between the two, we do have a resource on our blog that really breaks it down um, in such a way that you can also you might need to kind of reverse engineer what kind of gift you're looking at. Was this a pledge or is this a recurring gift? Um, and so that, that will help you do that if you check out our blog. So we're coming up on time here. If anyone has any lingering questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I think we have time for about two more. Um, this question asks if you guys have any recommendations for low cost donor management apps or software. I'd be happy to answer that, Virginia, if you'd like. Great. Thank you. Maybe you felt me smiling on the other end. <laughs> so um, what you may not have heard from the very beginning is that um, Virginia and I work for a very affordable donor management software company. It's called Little Green Light. Um, and um, you can definitely check us out at littlegreenlight.com. You can see that address right here at the bottom of the screen. Um, we do offer a free 30-day account so you can test out LGL and test out some of what Virginia was talking about today. That is the ability to um, store information as it pertains to gifts that you're receiving and creating acknowledgement templates that you can store and utilize to send mail or email directly from um, the system and have it documented automatically. Um, so um, definitely feel free to take a look at Little Green Light. In terms of other systems that are out there, I definitely would encourage you to check out um, resources like Captera um, or G2. Those are software review sites. Um, and you can actually go to our website and click on the reviews tab and link off to those uh, third, third party software review sites. And they will also give you um, a list in comparisons of um, different donor management software companies that are available for you. Great, thank you, Timmy. Um, and our last question for today, I've seen a lot of questions coming in about um, formats for thank yous. So whether this be direct mail, email, another kind of electronic statement, um, if you all have any recommendations for that, just to, to kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, well, as long as it's in written format, um, email and, and mail are both good options. I would say um, if, if you don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, I would pick the one that is most um, comfortable and manageable for your organization. Um, I do think there are donors who, who, who do prefer um, a hard copy in the mail. That being said, a hard copy is easier to lose, lose a pile at the, on their kitchen table, and you may hear from them asking for another copy when they're working on their taxes. Um, so email um, does have the advantage of they can search their inbox, but I think it's it really comes down to what's most reliable and um, easy to implement 
for you in terms of your workflow. Um, the other option um, is that you could, I know, in, for example, in LGL, if you're sending your email acknowledgments, you can choose to attach a PDF version of it so that the donor can, can print that out, um, you know, that looks more formal than printing out the email. And I just might also add that, you know, sometimes the other determining factor is what the preference of your donor is. Um, and again, in Little Greenlight, you can document donors' preferences for an email versus a hard copy mail and then act accordingly as gifts are received. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Virginia, and thank you, Timmy, for helping us out during the, uh, the Q&A. This is going to be the formal close of this workshop. I want to remind our audience that all materials and recordings will be available on our website in addition to being sent out via email by the end of the day tomorrow. Thank you so much for participating in how to create an effective acknowledgement strategy for your nonprofit. And again, thank you, Virginia and Timmy, for educating our community. Thank you.